What does avocado have to do with mead? Let's find out. So Jared and Gavin sent us some avocado honey from a local Florida place, actually, from Bee Natural Honey. Now we have actually purchased this in stores, not the avocado honey, but Bee Natural Honey. We've used it before. It's good stuff. Um, actually, it's like the regular brand at Publix now, I think. Um, so it's quality honey. This is avocado honey, though, which I've never had avocado honey. <laughs> I don't know what it tastes like, but a lot of people have actually asked us for this over time. And I put out on our community tab, what would people like me to make with this? And the range of results was kind of interesting. Many people were thinking like salsa and Mexican food meads. They thought it would taste like guacamole, um, all that kind of thing. So I thought, let's find out what this tastes like. I'm pretty sure it's going to taste like honey. But a really good suggestion that we were given by our viewers, which we actually didn't think about initially ourselves, which you know, you, you, you get too excited about all the different variables that are out there for you to do and you forget the simple thing. And the simple thing is brand new honey, probably a very distinct flavor. We don't know what it tastes like out of mead, so why don't you just make a simple mead out of it? Good idea. So that's what we're going to do. Oh boy, this is some thick, dark honey. This looks like the Brazilian, or not the Brazilian, the African honey. Yeah. Go ahead and have some of that. We're sharing a spoon. Get over it. Oh, that is like deep, rich, it's earthy. It's like, like molasses almost. Yeah. It actually tastes almost bouchéed. Yeah. It's an extraordinarily rich taste though. Yeah. I don't want to flavor this. I want to make this into a mead as is because I think it's really interesting, really it, unique. It does taste bouchéed. I'm getting like the it's caramel, almost the coffee notes. Yep. Yeah, coffee, coffee, cacao, like chocolate, um, a burnt toffee. Yeah. Um, wow, really, really interesting. Not at all what I was expecting. No, <laughs> doesn't taste like guacamole at all. <laughs> Not even remotely. Just so you know. So, due to it being so unique and so interesting, by the way, that was not scripted. We actually did not taste this off camera. You saw me fiddling with the lid, right? Yeah. So, I mean, that's legit. It's really, really good. I don't know that I would put it on food, though. Like, it seems like it's meant for fermenting rather than... Yeah, it's it's super Although in different. baked goods, I could, I could imagine it being really good. Certain things. Yeah, like in a carrot cake or a, a, a one of but those kind of... But now we're going off track. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that was my fault. Um, all want, right. You want this in there? Yes. So there always is the question of when you're making a mead, how much honey do you want to use? And you can use anywhere from one pound to as high as I've heard some people get away with four pounds. I don't recommend that. It's going to be a little bit difficult. We are a natural brewer, which means we don't really use a lot of additives and chemicals and things like that. This is meant to be a super easy mead. Like, Anybody could make this. By the way, if you don't have avocado honey, you can substitute any honey and make this recipe. It just won't taste the same, but it'll still be a good mead. Um, today, we are literally just going to use honey, water, yeast. Very simple. Yes, I made the sound. Sorry. <laughs> so the question becomes how much to use. If I use one pound, it's going to be a hydromel or a light mead. It won't have much alcohol, won't have much honey character. If I use too much, I could overpower my yeast, possibly stall, make a lot of alcohol flavor. It might take a long time to age. So I want somewhere in between. I also want something that comes out dry so that we can get a real character of this mead itself without just overall sweetness for no apparent reason. So I came to two and a half pounds because I don't really know what the gravity reading of that honey is. Okay, most honey runs about 0 0.035 gravity or 35 points, some people will call it, per pound in a gallon of must, not in addition to a gallon in the gallon. So mix up one gallon of must and if one pound of that is honey, it's gonna be about a 1.035 gravity. If none of that made sense, we do have a video that explains all of that. So two pounds should be like 1.070, Two and a half pounds would be like around 1085-ish. But 
We've also seen some honeys like Beverly's honey that are higher than 0.035. Usually don't see lower, but higher we have seen. So I'm afraid this might be a little bit higher because it does seem stronger. It's more dense. So it is possible there's less liquid in this, less moisture. So it's a little bit higher sugar content. So even if it's 1.040 instead of 35, we're still only going to be like a 1.100 starting gravity. I know, a lot of numbers. It's all speculation until we take the actual numbers. So let's go ahead and fill that's, it up. That's her polite way of telling me to shut up. You did over talk the scale, so you have to reset the scale. Yep. Now, this is really, really full too. That, this is a little scary. All right, I'm going to stand up so I can yep. keep track. We're going to the standard uh, positioning for pouring honey, which is Derica stands at the top and watches that I don't overfill the funnel. I'm and holding it just just now, just to okay, start. Let it go one one time, just real quick. Okay, all right, and I'm just gonna put in two and a half pounds. So this may take a little while for all that to come out. That's a lot of honey in there. Okay, so now that the honey is poured in. You can probably still see it's dripping a little bit. The funnel is coated in honey. So we have some warm water, probably 110 degrees or so, I would say. That's Fahrenheit, by the way, because if it was Celsius, that would be really hot water. But anyway, I'm going to pour to about halfway so that I can dissolve some of the honey that's in the funnel and start to mix this up. Not even coming off the funnel. Now, I only fill it to halfway because it makes it a lot easier to shake this up and add oxygen and mix the honey. And I'm using a solid stopper in the top. I call it my thumb saver bung because there's no hole to hurt your thumb as you're doing this for long periods of time. And now we shake the bejesus out of it. We anticipate this is going to take longer than usual because yeah. this honey is super thick. Yeah. That's why we use warmer water than we might normally, but not hot. You don't want to go above 120 degrees Fahrenheit because then you can potentially kill yeast later. But you can already see, this looks like beer, okay? This is way darker than most honeys we've ever used. A word about this too, I am oxygenating this must. It's important in the beginning. You want to because your yeast need oxygen to build a colony. A lot of people have the misconception that the amount of yeast you add is all the yeast that's going to be in there and that the amount of yeast you add has something to do with how much alcohol you're producing. These are living organisms. They're going to do what we do best. Yeah, which is <laughs> propagate and reproduce. Um, but I'm going to use a full packet of yeast today. I normally don't, but I'm altering that rule a little bit. More on that in a minute. Let me get this mixed up. I do have a general rule of thumb when it comes to mixing. And that is shake it up till you think you're done, then go at least two minutes more. Today I'm going to make that more like three minutes more because this stuff is just really dark and really thick and it seems harder to mix than usual. All right, so I have that mixed up pretty good. Remove my stopper. It's probably going to spit at me. They usually do. Yep, builds up just a little bit of pressure from the hot liquid in there. Now, a word about sanitization. We do sanitize everything. All the gear here, everything that we use has been sanitized in. The red bucket of sanitization! Which is literally a red bucket sitting on the floor right over here that has sanitizer liquid in it. That is star sand mixed with water. And we literally just leave everything in there until it's time to use it, let it drip dry, put it on the towel. The towel ends up getting covered in sanitizer liquid. Our hands end up getting covered in it. So we're being clean, okay? You don't have to get super crazy about it, but you do want to be clean. Everything was washed first with soap and water, and then it gets sanitized. But anyway, back to your previously recorded message. <laughs> so now I have a must with a lot of foam in it, and that the foam is always an issue, okay? I hate that, but it's just the way it is. And what I'm gonna do is put the funnel back in. And I'm gonna add more water. Now I wanna be careful this time that I don't overfill. Um, I call this being greedy. You see how that funnel's bubbling like that? If you hold it to the side just a little bit, it doesn't tend to gurgle as much. As much as we want to add oxygen, at this point I don't want to make more foam. All right, we're rounding the corners of the bottle now. This is where it starts to get a little tricky. I want to make sure that I get a gallon out of this. So I'm going to go a little bit higher with the darker part, not the foam. The foam, some of it might just push into my airlock and I'll just have to clean it out. No big deal. 
but I don't want to go too much further than about right there. Okay, so when I fill up my pitcher, I did fill it to the 4,000 milliliter mark. And when I did that, so that way we could tell you exactly how much water we added. Normally we just say add enough water to fill to the gallon mark, but some people wanted a more precise, precise measurement. So we actually used 2,700 milliliters, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 96 ounces or three quarters of a gallon. So there you have it. <laughs> So now we're going to take our gravity reading, which may or may not influence if we're going to try to squeeze a little bit more water in here right. or not. Because this is probably just slightly less than a gallon, it may be a little higher of a gravity artificially because, well, the same amount of sugars in less of a gallon is going to make a higher gravity. Also, you may notice the syringe. This is the master baster alternative, if you've ever watched any of our other videos. And I'm experimenting with this. We've only used it one other time, and it added more oxygen than I really cared for in that particular instance. But I'm going to try it again for taking a reading this way. The reason the master baster got replaced is it's messy. There was no way to actually use it properly and not just get it everywhere. So to me, this seems like a much cleaner alternative. And once I have it drawn up, I just have to put this over here reach in, grab my tube, maybe a drop gets out, and then slowly push this back in. And I can actually put it all the way to the bottom so I don't get any, well, oxygen doesn't matter now, but for future, it's also a 100 mil syringe, so I can actually get a full on, one huge graduated cylinder full of the must into the cylinder. Is that sucker really not floating? No, there, it is. There it, is. it is. It's being held back. No, no, no. You want more. Really? There you go. You want your, you want your hydrometer to float. Because if it's not floating, it's sitting on the bottom, and you're not really getting an accurate reading. Feels more mad scientist -y to use the syringe. <laughs> I kind of like it. Before I get to that reading, something very important that you need to do with every single time you make a brew is take notes. I'm making up our label that I literally just masking tape to the side of this fermenter. And the information that I put on it are avocado mead. The name of what you're brewing. Yeah, don't put avocado mead if it's not avocado <laughs> mead. I'm going to put today's date, which is May 21st. It's May already, almost June already of 2021. This year is like gone. And the initial reading, which is going to be 1.096. So either due to the fact that there's a little bit more gravity in this honey, or we used a little bit less of a gallon, that's why that reading is a little bit higher than you might think it should have been. Now there's an important lesson to be learned here, and Brian probably wasn't going to divulge this, but I think it's important to tell you, the audience, who is trying to learn from us. And that's if you take a reading and something doesn't seem right, there's probably a good reason for that. So after filling it halfway and shaking it, once you fill it all the way, you need to shake it again, otherwise the sugars aren't the parts of the video that we're not going to show because there was some cursing and expletives <laughs> involved is I did that. I didn't shake it up again. And I took a reading and it came out to 1.020. So you have five minutes of me sitting here scratching my head trying to figure out how in the heck this got to 1.020. <laughs> Put the bung back in, check the bottom, make sure it was all shaken up. And then Derek said, did you shake it up after you did that? And I said, nope, but I did now. <laughs> so always remix. This stuff is so dark that I couldn't even tell. Yeah. A lot of the time you can see a difference. This time there was like, there was nothing to see. So let that be a lesson to you. Always make sure there's no bejesus left before you take a reading. <laughs> Cause a 1.020 versus a 1.096 is a big difference. Okay. So the next thing that we're going to add is the yeast and we are using Lalvin 71 B, which one of the things I really like about Lalvin yeast is this. I can open it with my fingers. 
Some other companies can learn from that. They make you use scissors to open up the yeast packets. I don't see the point. Now, I always had a rule. If you're making one gallon, up to three gallons, really, use half a packet of yeast. If you're going over three gallons, use a full packet of yeast. And if you're making exactly three gallons, do whatever you want. I'm altering that a little bit. If you think about it, there's no extra adjuncts in this meat, okay? It is honey, water, and yeast, and that is it. Now, some people say that that's the only way to actually make mead. Anything else isn't actually mead. Well, not really, but that's another story. But my new rule is, if I'm not adding adjuncts and things that might give it a little bit more of a boost or things for the yeast to use, I'm going to use a full packet of yeast, okay? Because it gives the yeast a little bit extra, gives them a firmer foundation to start from. So that's the way we're doing it. That's my story for today and I'm sticking to it. I may change that sometime in the future. And when you get to the bottom, you have to thwack your yeast. See? You'd be amazed how much more is coming out. It's just a thing, you gotta do it. But now I actually wanna shake this up oh, again. Right. So I'm going to put the bung back in it and you're, you're shaking it just to disperse the yeast really. You don't even have to do this, but you, what you want to do is just like swirl it this way, because if you try to shake it, some will get stuck to the sides and on the neck of the bottle and that's just no good. You don't want that. Now that we have our finished must, we're going to put an airlock and a stopper on it. And all that does is it's a way for it keeps bugs out and lets gases escape. Okay, you'll see the airlock will start to look, it'll push gases up this way down into this cylinder and fill up this side, which is the exit side, and go up. If your airlock does not have little tiny holes in the top, make some. Take a pin, poke them through, heat it up a little bit if you have to, or just take the cap off. But I don't recommend taking the cap off. That cap is, it serves a really good purpose, keeps bugs out. But I've seen some people have airlocks that do not have holes in the top, which makes me go, what? Well, that's a poor design. It definitely needs to have holes in the top or it's not going to work properly. It's not going to do what an airlock is meant to do. And, you know, I recommend using one. We have a video on why not to use balloons. That's a whole other story, too. And I'm just going to affix it to there. Sometimes they like to pop back out. Make sure they're dry before you put that in there. And if it still pops out, get a rubber band, loop it around the handle. It, it all works good. I've even used masking tape. Some people use duct tape. Don't use super glue. Somebody did that and then they asked me how to remove the stopper later. Man. There really isn't any way to save that one anymore. Anyway, this is now going to go into a out of direct sunlight, basically. You can leave it in a, a lit room. Artificial light doesn't seem to harm yeast much, but we actually have a fermentation area that is dark. We just like it that way. Temperature. A lot of people ask this. Our house maintains a constant 79 degree temperature since we got a new AC unit recently that's really, really efficient. So it maintains 79 degrees day and, day and night, and that way we have constant temperature. If you're a little cooler than that, it's fine. Below 65, though, I would start doing something to warm it up, whether you have a heating pad or even just a blanket over them sometimes is enough. If you go much higher than 79, like past 85 degrees, I would start thinking of ways to cool it down, like put it in a bucket of water, wrap a towel in, wet a towel, wrap that towel around your fermenter. That will actually cause some evaporation and cool it off. It is true that the higher temperatures will increase protectivity, but it also can produce more off flavors. Oh, yeah. And that's why we don't want to go too high. Yeah, past 85 worries me. Now, every yeast has its own tolerance range. And, you know, look at the yeast that you're using. We are using 71B. I happen to know that it works beautifully in our environment. I don't actually know offhand what the temperature range for 71B is. I just know that it works in our environment. So whatever you used to use, make sure that it fits your environment. So in a few moments, we'll show you what this looks like once it gets going. Okay, so it's been like an hour, maybe? We had a little bit more video recording to make, and as you can see, it is bubbling away. But let's take a closer look. So you see we have pretty consistent activity in the airlock here. Of course, nobody said that it's going to delay, but there we go. Thank you. <laughs> and as we travel farther down, we still have a decent amount of foam, but you see the larger bubbles that's starting to break down and, and disperse. And these little granules that you see floating at the top here are actually yeast particles. 
and you can kind of see, I don't know if this camera can show you, but some of the yeast particles are floating around this in, in suspension and they're doing the kind of the lava lamp thing where they kind of float up and then they float down. And we have a collection at the bottom already as well, which normally means they are already really happy and starting to get funky with it. And yes, that's a technical term. So yeah, this is obviously already working well because here's the thing, this is warm, it still yeah. feels warm to the touch. The air outside of it is cooler than that. So it should actually be the opposite way. There should be a negative pressure effect as this cools and the air compresses back down rather than expands. So obviously something is working. I do believe though that the colony is still building. We are still in the initial phase but some of those yeasts are already working. They're kind of taking time off from the reproductive duties to um, have some sugar for more energy to be able to go back. I don't, I don't really know. <laughs> I'm just guessing. But that does seem to make a little bit of sense. Uh, this we basically have a Roman orgy going on in here. Yeah. <laughs> um, with that said, this is going to ferment like we said, in a dark place for a few weeks. It'll probably take anywhere from two to three, maybe even four weeks. Once we start seeing that airlock activity slow down a lot, we'll take our first reading, but that'll be in the next video. In the meantime, look up. There's another video up there. You might like that one too.